Gage, let me know if I'm set up properly here, Gage. All right. Meeting is being recorded. Fantastic. Welcome, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I am Rich Brady. I am the uh, I'm an investment advisor here in our Texas office for Oxford Wealth, and we welcome you here today uh, for our market update. Um, excited to have you and uh, look forward to any questions that you may have. Be sure to use our chat button uh, on your uh, on the Zoom and uh, be sure to fire questions at us if you have any questions as we go through some of the material today. Um, as far as just the topics we're going to cover, there's our disclaimers, typical uh, stuff that we always have to show uh, about myself. I've uh, been with Oxford uh, coming up on overall about 12 years, but full time over the last five. Today, we're going to go over the uh, economic and market update, uh, just what's happened over the last 30 days since we last met. Also, we're going to cover just briefly, what is the SECURE Act? We know we've covered it from time to time, and perhaps in our appointments, we haven't had the time to really go deep. And so we'd like to take a minute and uh, just cover some of the highlights uh, with you. And then lastly, just some considerations that you may want to consider uh, in pre-retirement. We're going to go deep to start, and then we're going to kind of poke our head out on the back end and then go more strategic or just give you some things, plant a few seeds on the back end just to make sure that your strategic plan for your retirement is in place. And we're going to talk about a few things there. So what is happening? Let's go down the path then and talk about economic highlights. What's happened in the last uh, month since we last met? Yesterday, there was a report that came out that said that GDP came in at 2%. Two, two now, where does that fall compared to previous quarters? In fact, previous quarters were at 2.9 in the third quarter of last year, and uh, it dropped at 2.7 in the fourth quarter. So isn't that good news, if you will, that GDP is coming down? Now, by the way, GDP is just a measure of goods and service output in our economy here in the U.S. And so if our economy is slowing, that's a good thing. And it does have some impact on inflation. Inflation numbers came in a few weeks ago at 4.1%. And as you know, uh, that is just a measure of CPI or consumer prices that you and I pay when we go to the pump or to the grocery store. And uh, it was as high as almost 9%. It's come down to four. The challenge here is that even though supply and demand is getting in equilibrium, there still are services and some goods that remain extremely inflated, namely fuel and food remain inflated. And uh, it is not where uh, those that are in charge of our economy uh, are comfortable. It's in fact, their target is 2%. So they're looking at still taking steps uh, to and taking proactive measures to, to look at the economy and to see what they can do to slow that or to reduce the price of, of goods and services. The third one, so what's the tool, right? They've used rate hikes and interest rate hikes to try to slow down uh, the flow of goods and services in our economy. Again, that is their primary tool. They have, uh, I would say, kind of hit pause, but at the same time, they did not increase rates in May. But uh, Jerome Powell made the comment that he and the Fed reserves the right to increase rates, even if it's an incremental rate hike, they reserve the right to increase rates in the future. Um, and that's kind of struck kind of a pause in the market over the last little bit. We'll get into some of that and what that looks like. So um, the last one I wanted to touch on was the yield curve. The yield curve, and anybody that knows anything about Oxford, we talk about the yield curve quite a bit. And the, and the chart there at the bottom of this slide, what it shows is that in July of 2022, the yield curve inverted. Just real quickly, what is the yield curve? It is a measure of the two-year return on a U.S. Treasury bond and the 10-year U.S. Treasury bond. A normal yield curve, your short-term rates are going to be lower return 
the longer term rates, which theoretically should have higher risk, should give you a higher return. But there are times in our economic history when they invert and the shorter term rate gets higher than the long term rate. That is where we are at now. Short term rates on U.S. Treasuries are paying more than longer term rates. And that's what you see on the graph down at the bottom. That happened in July of 2022, and it has stayed inverted over the last year. It's the longest time frame uh, or the largest inversion that has occurred since the 1980s. Now, at the end of the day, why should you care? What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, is that within 11 months of every inversion, a recession has happened over the last 60 years. So that's important to those that are looking at the economy, looking at markets, trying to make evaluations and analytics on where is the economy going. So with an inverted yield curve, it's a sign of slowing. The challenge here is that there's other indicators in our economy that aren't so consistent with that indicator. Okay, so the economic metrics are kind of, they're positive, but, and better than they were a year ago, but uh, there's still some things we've got, we're gonna have to work out to see how does that apply to, to the markets. Um, I threw this slide in here, not so much that it was so helpful, but last year I gave an update on the, uh, on inflation and that uh, inflation was going to be here for a while. And uh, what the Fed was going to do, like raise rates to try to slow down the economy. And at that time, um, what it really said was, is that, that we were anticipating through 2022, a significant increase over what they had communicated previously. They had said that the highest that the Fed rate was going to go was 4.75 basis points. Um, or, or was 4.75. But after the communication in March, they said, hey, look, things are going to get more aggressive in the future. And we're going to raise hikes even further. They said about 5.3. Uh, 5 so where are we now? We're at 5.3, which is interesting, isn't it? So we're at 5.3 and policymakers now are saying that there's going to be several more rate, rate hikes. And just to reiterate a point or two I've, I've made already, but the question is why? And it's because the economy is really showing some resistance, some resilience to some of the effects or some of the steps that have been taken to this point uh, due to higher interest rates. GDP is up and consumer spending remains extremely high. In fact, it's the highest that it's been now in the last two years. So in other words, people are saying, hey, despite these higher interest rates, the, the cost to be able to go get a loan at a bank to buy a car, the cost to buy a new home. Despite those higher interest rates, we're gonna keep spending. That's what the message is. That's what the data is that's come in over the last period of time. Underlying all this is that we have record low unemployment. And so people have jobs, they're feeling safe, they're feeling secure, and they're spending money. And so that's counteracting some of the actions that the Fed has taken to try to tighten uh, the ability to get your hands on money. And uh, it's kind of presenting an interesting challenge. So as a result, inflation remains high. Over four, as I've mentioned, uh, their target though is 2%. I expect that the Fed will raise rates a bit more this year. Uh, I think that the markets have really baked in those rates into the cost of stock, ETFs, mutual funds. It kind of has a rippling effect across all of securities. And... Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm obviously not going to sit here and predict where I think the markets are going, but the uh, I can tell you that at least some of our politicians are planning on going out on the campaign trail and marketing some of the successes that they feel they've been able to navigate through over the last year related to the economy. So what does all this mean for the stock market? Well, as you know, the S&P, if you've paid any attention at all to the markets, the markets have been up. In fact, they're at the, the S&P is up over 15% this year. Uh, I would say that's a good thing. Some of you have seen some increases, some uh, appreciation in your portfolios. That's a good thing. We, we like that. That certainly as an advisor, it's great news when we sit down for a portfolio review. The, the challenge here is that most of the increases have come from some of the larger firms in our economy, tech firms in our economy. 
This is a new phrase that I'm going to, or a new acronym I'm going to introduce you to. It used to be FANG stocks. And I'm, I know I'm going to miss one, but let me try. Uh, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Netflix, Google. Um, I'm sure there's one or two others that I'm forgetting. That was the FANG stocks. Now the mantra is, or the stocks that are included now are called Matana for Microsoft, uh, Apple, Tesla, NVIDIA, Alpha, uh, Alphabet, which is Google, and then Amazon. Those are the seven different stocks that make up uh, Montana or Matana. Now, why am I sharing that? Because if you look at the graph there at the bottom, what this is saying is it is really those stocks, those seven stocks that have led the upward pressure on the S&P so far this year. So if you are invested in large cap growth uh, tech stocks, uh, you've seen a sizable appreciation in your portfolio this year. Um, the rest of the market, less so. So, But those seven, if you're invested there, you've done quite well. Now, what are the reasons why? Well, I highlighted three reasons that I could find in some of my research as to what's driving this increase. Many of you may have heard of AI or artificial intelligence. Well, many of those servers and those large data centers are needing to be upgraded, which is then driving a refresh of semiconductors to feed that technology. So NVIDIA, which is the black line, by the way, on this chart down below, NVIDIA has just blown up this year. And they are one of the stocks that if you're, if you're lucky enough to be in NVIDIA and hold that as an individual security, you've done extremely, extremely well this year. They make these type of processors that go into um, AI data centers. Earnings have also defied uh, uh, expectations. Earnings have been really solid and have come in higher than expectations by the analysts. And then lastly, there is anticipation, given the reasoning I just shared with you on the previous slide, that there's going to be kind of a stability in rate hikes. And if they are, they're going to be small and minor. Um, or they're going to be uh, uh, paused, at least for the foreseeable future. And so the markets have responded really favorably to uh, this news, and our, our, uh, uh, the markets have done very, very well. So I just wanted to highlight that. Now, others are saying, all right, Rich, I'm still nervous about the markets. I'm still not ready to go all in. I want to be more conservative. What are my options? Gage in a previous, uh, either as a market update or an OWA live shared about one of the messages that we're sharing with our clients, which is uh, you have alternatives to money just parked at a bank. You have three or four options. I just want to briefly share with you what those rates are looking like right now so that uh, this may be a tickler for having a further discussion either with us or with your financial advisor. Previously, we talked about I bonds and though I stands for inflation. And it's an investment with the U.S. government, and it is intimately tied to inflation. With inflation coming down, so has this rate. So from May to October, that is the, the cycle that we're in now, uh, it is paying 4.3%. So should you be selling? Should you be buying more? We're really saying it's a hold. In other words, you really don't need to sell, but I would. we're not recommending that you buy any more I-bonds at this point. Cash management is another strategy that's a bank alternative. Um, banks, all they do when you deposit money with them, they take that money and they invest it elsewhere. Many times they will go buy U.S. Treasury uh, notes or bonds with that money. And you can bypass the bank. They get a margin, right, on taking your money and making that investment. You can do this yourself and make a uh, an investment with the US government. That's what we call cash management. And if you look at the chart there on uh, right in front of you, what you see is a three month, six month and a 12 month US treasury is bringing over 5%. Again, that is an investment with the US government. So those three yields, anything less than a year is bringing a 5% return on your uh, direct investment with the US government. That's a good thing. And so if you've got, uh, you have the ability to buy these yourself, or if you have a large block sitting at a bank and you go, you know, guys, I just want you to do this for me. We can help you with that as well. 
Um, a third one, and maybe even a more simple one, which is just investing with um, a high yield savings account. Uh, you can find out who those banks are that offer these high yield accounts through bankrate.com. If you have any questions, just reach out to one of us. We'd be happy to help guide you as to where that website is and how to navigate that website and where you can find out what the rates are. But there are firms, banks that are offering four and a half to 5% on your money uh, just by parking it with a bank, which is a good thing. And uh, so rates are extremely solid there. And the last one I'll mention is what we call a multi-year guaranteed account. It is a fixed annuity, yes, but it is a guaranteed rate of return on an investment with an insurance company, not so much a, a bank. These are bringing, uh, still, these rates are quite solid. A one year is bringing 4.25, a two year on Amiga is bringing 4.7, and a three year is bringing 5.4%. So those are alternatives. If you're sitting on a, a, a savings account, again, we always talk about maintain your three to six month uh, safe reserve at your bank so that you can reach out and get it if there's a need and you need to have that cash reserves. But any money in addition to that, there are investment alternatives that you have available to you. And we wanna to continue to put this in front of you so that you know what your options are. If the market is not where you wanna be, this is an option. Okay, uh, to my last couple of points here <clears throat> in my last 10 minutes, I wanted to talk a little bit about the SECURE Act. I, it's a long name. It stands for Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement. I know, where do they come up with this stuff? Um, but the SECURE Act was initially passed three or four years ago, and then it was refreshed again back in December of last year. A couple of three different strategies I wanted to make sure that you were aware of some of this may be new, some of it may not be. It's okay if I touch on something that you hadn't heard that you haven't heard of, make sure that you bring it up next time we visit. RMDs have changed. The age in which you must take your RMD. That stands for required requirement dis, uh, sorry, required minimum distribution. That's where you're required to take money out of pre-tax accounts like IRAs. The RMD age used to be 72. It's been increased starting this year to 73. I also wanted to make note that I get it, it's 10 years down the road, but if there's those of that are online that are in their 50s, uh, early 60s, just be aware that in 2033, the RMD age is gonna increase to 75. Why? Well, the government, you know, they're not in the business of giving out free money, but um, in it, when it comes to this, they realize that we, all of us are living longer. And so as a result of that longevity, they realize that, uh, you know, we can take a couple of more years to start pulling money of those out of those retirement accounts. And it gives those retirement accounts another two or three years to grow. Now, what happens if you forget? There used to be an incredibly, I thought almost unfair, uh, penalty if you forget to take your RMD out of that. Uh, generally, it's an IRA account. And uh, that uh, it used to be a 50% penalty. It's been reduced to 25%. And if you take care of it in a what is called a timely manner, it can be reduced to 10%. Now, it requires you going back and, and uh, uh, taking some steps with the IRS, et cetera, but you can reduce that penalty to 10%. The second thing I wanted to mention, which is uh, what I kind of categorized into higher catch-up contributions. In 2025, and, and this is really quirky, I'll tell you right now, I, it's even difficult for me to explain, but if, if in for workplace plans, for those that are between 60 and 63 in 20, starting 2025, you can contribute the greater of $10,000 or 150% uh, of the standard catch up. In other words, the catch up used to be like 7,500, now it's been raised. So the point is, if you're, if you're between 60, 61, 62, 63, your ability in 2025, if you're between those ages, you're gonna be able to catch up or put additional dollars away uh, for retirement. And that's a good thing, it's good for all of us. And then lastly, 529s. We get questions frequently about 
I'm investing in my grandson's or granddaughter's education. Uh, but what happens? I've got $10,000 set aside. What happens if they choose not to go to college and are not able to use these dollars for educational purposes? I think, honestly, of all the changes, I think RMDs was a big one, but this one is huge. Something that we should sit down together and make sure that we're uh, incorporating this into your overall financial strategy. But after 15 years of that 529 sitting there, those assets can be rolled over into a Roth IRA for your beneficiary. That's huge. In other words, you can create a Roth account for your grandchild. Now, there are limits on the amount of annual contributions to the account, and there's a max, a lifetime max of $35,000. But for heaven's sakes, if you can put $35,000 away for your grandson's retirement and, and have that compound over time, that's just a significant contribution you can make towards the retirement of your grandchildren. Now, just a couple of quick nice-to-knows or good-to-knows. If you are giving uh, uh, contributions to, in the form of a QCD, a Qualified Charitable Distribution, you're giving that away. There are new rules. Don't have time to go into it now. I just want to highlight that for you, that uh, there are more liberal rules that have been established for QCDs. Also, that employers may provide employees the option to receive Roth invested matching contributions. What that means is, Yes, in a 401k plan, your employer, if they choose, that's a, a big asterisk there, if they choose, their contributions to your 401k plan could be in after-tax dollars or Roth dollars. That's huge. Certainly, anyone that visits with me, I am recommending that in your 401k, look at, it's at least make uh, inquire of your HR department, can we invest in Roth 401ks? If you do, make sure you're leveraging that and taking advantage of that. But the employer portion can now either be pre-tax or post-tax. It's an important consideration. I don't anticipate many employers are going to hop on the bandwagon to do this because that would take away their tax deduction. But it's a good thing to know about, that it is an option to you if your employer offers it. Lastly, Roth accounts in employer plans are no longer subject to RMD rules. If you do have Roth money sitting in a 401k, historically, you've had to pay RMDs on those plans. That's no longer the case. So that's a nice benefit as well. So several things related to the SECURE Act. I know we're in the weeds. Uh, now let's pop our head up a little bit and talk a little bit more about retirement or pre-retirement and some thoughts that uh, you may want to consider as you go into those years leading up to retirement. So the first one, um, is not even a financial consideration. I just want to highlight for you that, that really retirement is a big deal and it can be a big deal both psychologically and emotionally, even a bigger deal than it is financially. So I, I the first phrase I wrote on the slide is visualize your retirement. Try to picture what are your hobbies? What are things you want to do? We always ask about that when we sit down together with new clients. What do you want to do with this money? What do you want to do in your retirement years? How do you self-actualize? How do you, what, what is something that's going to bring you joy uh, the rest of your life? And uh, that's an important thought to have. You can have all the money in the world, but if you don't know what you want to do with your time, then retirement can be very, very difficult. So visualize your retirement. Then the next five things I want to talk about related to financial considerations are building the strategy. A really critical part of this is, and what uh, we frequently will see is that many financial advisors, they may build, build what they call a strategy, but it's really just an investment plan. We focus on income, investments, taxes, uh, healthcare, and then finally in a state plan. And those are the five areas I'm just gonna briefly touch on here today, not go too deep, because I want to keep this pretty high level, but these are important things. And if you're missing any of these components in your strategy, make sure that you take them, uh, jot it down and bring it in. And let's talk about these five components the next time we sit down together. 
The first one is an income plan, right? And we know income is what retirement is all about. We'd like to illustrate that as you're leading up into retirement, you're concerned about a return on your investment. But once you hit that retirement date, you're concerned about the reliability of your income. And that reliability is so important. And so we'll spend time with you going through and building a strategy around your social security, making a decision around a pension. And there's usually five or seven options that are there. And many times there's some numbers and some evaluation around it. Uh, we can definitely help there. Annuities are a great way to generate income in retirement. And then finally, a tool that we use here at our firm, we talk about a, an asset ladder, an income ladder uh, that allows us to build a systematic uh, plan whereby we take some investments that you've saved during your working years, and we then turn that into systematic personal pension for you in retirement. So, so anyway, income is huge. It's a, it's, it's critical and probably one of the most, oops, one of the most critical things that, uh, that we plan for and strategize together. Uh, understanding your expenses and getting rid of debt, two huge things that we can sit down together and talk about. You can generate all the income you want, but if you haven't properly planned a budget or if you haven't planned to get out of debt, those are some things that we need to look at to ensure that you have adequate supply of income in your retirement years. Investments. Make sure that uh, you're sitting with us or your advisor and talking about the uh, maximizing the contributions. If you're still working as a 1099, if you're self-employed, there are incredible plans out there like SEPs where you can contribute significantly more than if you are a W-2 employee. There are different options, lots of considerations. I listed some that uh, some of you may be in, 401ks all the way to IRAs and Roths and Simples and SEPs and 403Bs. Gosh, I mean, there's, there's just a myriad of retirement plans, but you want to maximize your contributions as much as you can. Why? So that we generate as much income for you in your retirement years as, as we can. You want to pay attention. So many clients come walking through and say, Rich, Gage, Lynn, Brandon, I have, I'm in the, I'm in a target date fund. And what that is, is that it systematically adjusts each year and puts less into equities or stock and more into bonds. And it shifts and it automatically uh, does that each year, but they do that for unnecessary fees. There are better ways to optimize your portfolio. Let's sit down together and let's talk about that. Um, you can be either too conservative and not get the growth that you need, or what we frequently will see is that your portfolio may be invested too aggressively. And if there's a downturn, suddenly you're looking at having to work multiple more years in the future to make up for lost uh, value in your investment accounts. So it's trying to strike that balance between returns and risk. And then lastly, diversifying your asset classes. We frequently find that many portfolios are what we call correlated. They move together, meaning that if you have 10 or 12 mutual funds or 20 ETFs in your portfolio, many times we see that they move together. And we believe in diversified correlation or uncorrelated uh, investment strategies. When one is up, another asset class is down. That way you're balancing your risk. So risk, risk is extremely critical with investments. Tax planning, make sure that you're investing. You're, in fact, let me go so far to say that your number one obligation in retirement is, your, is gonna be your taxes. So you've gotta have an effective strategy to try to minimize your tax obligations today. Why do we say that? Because we believe taxes will likely go up in the future. In fact, it's built into the tax code. The current... Uh, uh, a Trump tax plan will expire the end of 2025. And so with an expiration date, you've got to be taking steps to move, if you will. We believe taxes are on sale and you should be taking steps now to move to a post-tax position where possible. Um, but you've got to build a strategy around that. So again, further discussions, lots of things to consider. Healthcare, uh, we know that uh, many choose to retire before age 65 and Medicare is an option. 
If you're one of those and you're 58 or 62 or 64, you understand that you're gonna have to build a bridge from where you are today to 65 until Medicare kicks in. So looking at different options, shopping the market or giving your referrals to others that can help you with your healthcare needs is, is extremely important. The last one I'll mention there is just uh, supplemental insurance or long-term care, uh, both extremely critical. Uh, yes, there are annuities that have long-term care provisions built in. Uh, if you do not have an annuity, then perhaps a long-term care discussion would be helpful. The last one is around estate planning. Don't want to go into too much detail, but you really have got to keep those wills and trusts updated as much as you can. And uh, if it's been more than five years, maybe it's, it's time to hit the refresh button and go back and update those documents. It's essential the last thing you want to do is have an extremely well-built plan, but it's not going to pass well to your beneficiaries because you didn't think through some of the considerations that are mentioned here. So those are five things that I wanted to highlight for you. I know it may be a little bit of a review for some. Some of Hopefully I've uh, hit maybe planted a few seeds on some things that maybe you want to come back in and, and refresh and have a discussion with us about or have that discussion with your financial advisor. Uh, but we believe in a holistic plan, a strategy in retirement. And it really does include include all five of these areas to make sure that that you're set up for success. And they all play in together. So uh, you can't just have a, an effective investment plan without in considering all the others. So it means working with a financial advisor that is a fiduciary and one that's got your best interest and is willing to get on the phone with your CPA or with your attorney and uh, to have those discussions. So uh, that is it. That's what I wanted to cover today. Um, and so I guess I'll hit stop there and let... Uh, Let's, uh, if anyone wants to stick around after we stop the recording and ask a few questions where I think we've got a couple of us here online and we'd be happy to answer those questions with you.